I'm Mark Seifter, and this is Arcane Mark. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me today when we're going to talk about Design Diaries Occult Adventures. Design Diaries is a very fun stream for me to do because I get to look back on some of the projects I've been worked on in the past, tell you guys like what was going on when we were doing this project. Occult Adventures is the first RPG line project that I was actually at the company for the entire process of outlining it, assigning it, everything that I presented in that earlier episode where I give you the whole process. Unchained already had some of those steps. They let me add some things in later on after the outline because they like the ideas, um, the rest of the design team, but I was not at the company yet during um, some of those early stages. Occult is the first one I was there for the whole thing. Uh, David says, I suppose you include yourself in not sure, not getting con crud. That is true. And if I get horrible con crud and I have no voice and I am some kind of like a lich re-coalescing around his phylactery, then next Tuesday's episode will also have to be canceled. So we're going to play it by, by ear or possibly by nose or throat um, for, for that. But let's get back into Occult Adventures. So if you guys remember the Design Diaries Medium episode, and even if you don't, to refresh your memory, Occult Adventures planning stage really began on a dark and stormy night in Indianapolis at the kind of spooky and occultish St. Elmo Steakhouse where the design team plus Eric and Brandon Hodge we're all discussing the ideas of the this new occult book. And I presume you guys all know the design team and Eric Mona, our publisher. Brandon Hodge um, has been a freelancer on a lot of products, especially during that era when Occult Adventures was coming out. And he's just a real-world master of the occult. To such an extent that he almost had his own TV show options. And in fact, he, not the network, was the one to turn it down after they wanted to give him a wacky co-host. And then they kept making the wacky co-host more and more of the focus of the show. And he was like, nah, I want it to be about the occult stuff. Candyman by trade. Interesting freelancer for sure. And he knows just about everything there is to know about the occult. And whatever else he doesn't and some of the things he does, Eric, our publisher is super into the occult and specifically some of the occult philosophies of the of the movement theosophy i don't know if you guys know a lot about theosophy but i sure do know more about it than i did before working at paizo especially from some of the conversations and some of the submissions that eric had with with respect to occult adventures and in some ways some of those ideas have reflected even further and deeper into other parts of the system after that. So, uh, King of Rock says, Brandon got two of my nerdy pursuits, paranormal and gaming. All right, what about candy? That could be your third one. Um, David says, basically crazy Victorians. Yes, it's basically crazy Victorians who are playing a telephone game with a hodgepodge of every philosophy they heard coming back from Asia. Um, to England, and somehow they're combining it, getting a lot of it just totally wrong, and theosophy. Um, it's pretty, pretty interesting uh, what they come up with. And we have a lot of it in Occult Adventures. So this is also a very special project because of the fact that Brandon's knowledge of the occult was so deep that we basically hired him on as a consultant in addition to doing some freelance for the book where he read over many sections of the book um i think all of the book and gave a consultant pass and like occult tips and other um other ideas in addition to all the designers who did the design pass and the editors with their edit pass and so on um Steve says, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was even worse. Yeah, they are sure uh, a thing. 
King of Rock asks who doesn't love candy. I don't know who doesn't love candy. But if you own a candy store and a Fiji mermaid, you might be Brandon Hodge. So, with our crew of the design team and Eric uh, and Brandon on board, a, a host of other really great freelancers who were really into this idea of the occult, we had... I would say for one of the first, uh, I mean, it was one of the first projects I worked on overall, but this is one of those projects where we just had a lot of people who were really into the subject matter and it shows in the project, I think. Uh, and King of Rock says, I love Brandon's haunt rules from Karen Crown. Brandon's haunt rules in, in Karen Crown were pretty cool. I, uh, they're among my top haunt rules. I would say Linda's haunt rules from Horror Adventures, even if I'm not going to be biased in favor of Linda, are still the best because they're the most comprehensive haunt rules. But if you combine Linda and Brandon's haunt rules, then you've got, like, everything you'll ever need for haunts, pretty much. So, um, with our Occult Adventures Dream Team uh, assembled, we basically got started, and I already told you a little bit about the medium. The medium had its own ups and downs, its ins and outs, all the other classes, basically, they certainly don't have a similar story to the medium, but you know some of the story just from the playtest. Kineticist was one I worked on, and uh, there was a lot of playtest feedback that helped refine and sort of double some of the access to certain elements um, that the Kineticist had. Mesmerist and the Psychic were Logan's babies, and he worked on those. The occultist was Jason's class, although he had so many other things that Logan and I filled in a lot of the th the new concepts like resonant powers that eventually came to be very important to the occultist class, and spiritualist was Steven. Uh, King of Rock says, I have a mesmerist in my group, and damn, does that stare crush. Yeah, the stare is really powerful. Do not underestimate the mesmerist stare. This is like underestimating the bard's buffs, just numerical benefits is that you could just add on to your group are very powerful. So those classes, obviously, since we needed to do the play test, we worked on them significantly ahead of time. And they were one of the deepest design lifts in Occult Adventures, just due to how much work you put into a class. And as I mentioned to you guys previously in this stream, the class is... Um, something that you've just got to get right. If you get one feat a little bit wrong, that's a feat. It's it's a shame you'd want to get that feat right, but a class is someone's identity. It's their character. It's who they are in the game. You have to get cla a class right, and you if the class is wrong, it is also more tentative to make an adjustment to it. Like, if you have some kind of overpowered hat that is busting up everyone's AC, people would get mad if you change that hat. But at least it's not changing them. Like, their identity isn't guy in that hat. But if you change a class, their identity is that class, and it can be really upsetting. So, classes are something that we put a lot of emphasis on, and we certainly did in Occult Adventures as well. Um, also in the class chapter is a section on some new um, favorite class options for the various ancestors, uh, the, ver uh, the various classes. I'm going to be saying ancestries. There's just no way around it. But the various classes have a bunch of different favorite class, or the various, not the various races, races, there you go, have, um, have a bunch of favorite class options for the new classes that are in the game. And those are just something we came up with after we had gone through all of the classes. King of Rock says that it's not so much just the stare, the spells, and feats that link off of it. Yeah, um, the Mesmerist has a lot of synergy with itself. And the more that you get, the more that you can sort of build off of it. And David mentions the Bard Song being similar and I would say yes, especially since it stacks with good hope. Once you're seventh level and you're just like, get hope, inspire courage for your first turn, 
That is a huge shift that just tectonically shifts the game. Finales are also definitely pretty powerful. And Linda says that Pathfinder 2nd Edition has invaded my mind. Uh, which Steve points out is on topic because occult text absolutely can invade your mind. Totally true. So what about the archetypes? The archetypes chapter probably doesn't have too many surprises for most people. Although, one interesting surprise I had about this book, and it's actually an overall thing for the book, but I'll talk about it now here with archetypes. As archetypes are ones that are easy to mess up. Occult adventures... You need to prorate these kind of threads for their age, just like you prorate sales for a product based on its age. But when you look at the errata threads, where people co collect errata for books and prorate for age, even if you don't prorate for age, Occult Adventures has some of the smallest number of errata of anything that we've ever published. And I'm still, to this day, not sure exactly why that is, but it definitely does. And maybe that is because it itself is so non-Euclidean that you could not call it right or wrong. It is beyond morality. I'm not sure. But the, the fact of the matter is, it was interesting. Um, it looks like King of Rock says he's really looking forward to occult being core in 2nd edition. Yeah, that's something that we're pretty excited about. Having occult uh, magic and occultism be in the core and connecting it to the bard, once we thought about it, really made sense in the world. We were kind of frightened that everyone would be really angry about that. But then it turned out that people really liked it a lot. So uh, I was very happy about that because some of the craziest ideas uh, for some of the classes, particularly sorcerers being all four different traditions and bards being a cult, Started with me and my own crazy uh, explanations based on the setting. Because among the design team, other than Jason, of course, who even designed huge parts of the setting. I'm one of the des the designers who work on the rules and not the setting normally. But who knows the setting um, a little bit more. And so I was trying to pull in setting elements. And we had already talked to James and um, Moreland about these essences. And I tried to come up with these ideas for the different things and pe I thought people in the company wouldn't like it but they did and I thought you guys might not like it but you did so I'm pretty happy I'm pretty thrilled and having the occult bards just gives a lot of opportunity to show a different side of, side of them but also show the same side the sort of essence of bards that we've always known about what they were doing and explain why they're doing what they're doing and how they're doing what they're doing and David says delineating a cult from psychic is tough. That is true. It's absolutely true. And I, actually, that reminds me of a story that should be in this design diary since it's a diary about my design. So when I was at Gen Con for Occult Adventures, that was my second Gen Con as, at Paizo, I wound up selling probably more books of Occult Adventures to people who definitely came in and were not going to buy it until I talked to them than any other product I've ever sold at Gen Con. I'm not saying that it sold more copies. It didn't. But a lot of people came on, and David is get, Nielsen is getting to this in the chat. Lots of people hold on to side dislike. Um, so what would happen? It was just perfect because it, it literally happened four times during the convention, about once per day two people would come up and be looking at it. And one of them would sort of decide to talk to me, and the other one is sort of listening at first, and the first person would be like, is this just psionics? And I would say, no, it's not psionics, actually. It was like, what do you think about psionics? And, um, oh, Majuna, hi. Uh, it's your first time to catch the stream? Well, I'm happy to have you here for sure. Um, we're always glad to have more people, and I'm super happy that we're an affiliate now from uh, enough people viewing, so thanks to everyone who watches the stream. So, I asked them, what do you think about Sonics? And the person who talked to me was different each time, but let's just say that it is the first person 
didn't like Sonic. So did actually usually the first person did the one who actually asked me. So they would be like, "Well, I really like Sonic. The Dreamscar Press did Sonic, so I don't think I don't need to buy this book." And so and the other person who was listening up to this point was like, "Well, you know what? I hate Sonic. I don't need to buy this book." And by the end of the conversation with those two people, which happened four times, and there was always someone who loved and hated Sonic there at the same time. I don't know why that is. But by the end of that conversation, both of them picked up the book and bought it. It was great, because I was like, well, you know, it's not Psionics. But, and I think that it, it, this, the reason it's not Psionics, might, you might like it, person who doesn't like Psionics. I would ask them why they didn't like it. Be like, well, it's, it's different. It's not that. Because they would be like, it's too sci-fi, it's got crystals and stuff. It would be like, it's really, and I would talk about how it's really rooted in the occult tradition, um, in sort of some of the real world fantasy. I would talk about how it's not about crystals and the mind only, it's about like the inner battle for our souls and the different essences of people. And oh yeah, thanks so much for the, uh, for the cheer, Steve. You are number one! And I now know for sure that cheering works. I was not sure until that point. Thank you very much. Um, but then I would tell the person who does like psionics, look, it's very different. But if you like psionics and the themes of psionics, this complements psionics really well because it's a different take on some of some of the same themes. And at the end, then essentially we wound up with both of them buying the book. So... As it turns out, separating a cult from Sonic was easy because we had Brandon and Eric really telling us what a cult was. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When Jason first told me what products all I would be working on, I was like, now that you're in the company, we're doing this Unchained. I was like, now oh, awesome. A cult adventured with psychic magic. I was like, oh my gosh, I love Sonic. He's like, no, it's not Sonic. So we'll explain it to you later. Oh, well, it sounds really cool. And then everything is like, and we're starting a new edition. Because I knew that from day one. It was a really good set of, of things to do. But I had to learn along the way why it was not Sonic. And they taught me really well. And it is pretty different. And uh, you guys know because you've read the book. But there's some really cool um, there's some really cool differences. I'm really glad to have it in core now as well. So um, King of Rock says, If the investigator appears again in PF2, please make sure to give it some occult options. I would say an occult investigator like in Call of Cthulhu is definitely a really cool idea. Uh, in to some extent, the investigator is a, in my opinion, and this is completely just off the cuff. I don't even know what's going to happen with it, but it is an idea that the overall idea and some of the new mechanics that Steven came up with it were so solid and missing that it transcends the fact that it was supposed to be a rogue alchemist hybrid class. I feel like surpasses and eclipses the part of it that like had sure Sherlock Holmes did chemistry, but there's so many investigators who might not have to do that. So I could easily see more cult investigators and other options that are not all super chemists, but who knows where, where we're going to go. The investigator definitely, definitely fits into at least the occult sort of storyline and the occult sort of schema. For sure. And we definitely had a psychic detective. Um, I remember that from the archetypes in A Call of Adventures. Speaking of which, the archetypes on A Call of Adventures. So, the archetypes in A Call of Adventures had... Oh yeah, the psychic searcher oracle, Linda points out. Didn't you play one of those in Crystal's uh, Hell's Rebels game, Linda? It was a That was a pretty cool archetype um, overall as well. Because it had a little bit of investigation while also... The Oracle's curse fits in well into an occult theme, too. A lot of things do, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, there it is. Good. Thanks for the link. So, when it came to the archetypes in this book, there was a lot that had to be done, especially for my section. Because we each did archetypes for our own classes, and then I did the um, other class archetypes. And by did, I mean a design pass. Obviously, the freelancers came in with great turnovers for all of these. And when I say obviously, turns out not so obviously because, in fact, one of the turnovers I was most looking forward to because what I had seen of it, it was amazing, was, as I mentioned in the Medium stream, John Compton's Medium Archetypes, which just, he he was 
playtesting one in one of his home groups, everything he told me, I was so eager to, to grab them, except they were for the other medium that we didn't publish. So, yeah, we had to generate completely new medium archetypes on the spot. And uh, that, was, that was interesting. Also, for Kineticist, um, there was... In the turnover, had some really good Kineticist archetypes, but it also sort of tried to do the void element without enough space to do the void element. And the way that turned out was we were like, well, let's wait for the void element, and I had to make a bunch of new Kineticist archetypes as well. Um, even though the class itself was not fully out yet, so it was a lot harder to make. It's, it's actually really hard to make archetypes for a class that's not out yet. And some books have had what I consider, and, and if you've seen the architect design episode, one of the biggest possible failures of an archetype is that the archetype screws up the entire class that it's from and becomes a must-pick take for the class. Um, I'm thinking of some of the gunslinger archetypes. And you might say, well, the gunslinger maybe had issues that those archetypes helped with. But if that's true, they're masking the issues. The class should have received changes and not just archetypes that make it better. Um, this is similarly true for the, the monk. Like, some of the monk archetypes sure were drastically more powerful than the monk. And not only might you say the monk needed it, but we actually did go and we fixed the monk. And did, that's why you can't put those archetypes on the unchained monk. They both totally um, do a similar thing. And, oh, hey, yeah, there's another cheer. Thanks so much, uh, Rex of Liquid slash king of anything uh for the uh for the cheer and david nielsen says that he thought the shaman managed to also really transcend the idea of its two parent classes i think so too i think the shaman was really its own thing um small medium at large has a cousin the medium medium in medium armor uh that is true linda there is definitely a medium medium and uh we need a happy medium for how many how many puns we're gonna make, but uh, I certainly will not mind. So, speaking of medium, yeah, I came up with just a bunch of medium archetypes that I just wrote during the design pass, and I I really like the storyteller for having some of the bards sort of performances. The spirit dancer is my absolute favorite because it has some of the like main character in persona style. I'm gonna just change which spirit I have. It's still not as flexible and as fast at changing its spirit as the alpha medium was, because that, that medium could just as a swift action change around, but it was it was faster in some ways. Sheppy TS Rise Reed guys mentions the inspired blade swashbuckler is another example of, a, of an archetype that on day one um, caused issues. I would say Daring Champion Cavalier, if we're talking about for Swashbuckler, um, even more so that it's but Inspired Blade certainly um, at least Inspire Blade has one of the ways of getting back Panache that it doesn't have from the basic swashbuckle. There is one thing you're giving up that you actually cared about. But it does have a drastic amount of help, especially what in terms of the extra feats early on when a swashbuckler is starving for feats. So certainly Inspire Blade Swashbuckler is up there, and Inspire Blade Swashbuckler is a problematic dip that causes a huge number of other uh, options and alternatives to suddenly, like, bust out. So, it, it, it has its own things, <laughs> for sure. Um, I would say the trippiest of the new medium archetypes definitely was the reanimated medium, where you were dead and you're just animating your own body. Um, and then, of course, the Kami medium, which, just the art is so cool. It has an like, origami bat, and... Uh, I liked it so much that the Kami medium had to become a part of Yoon's backstory. Um, David Nielsen mentions the Sacred Fist War Priest. The Sacred Fist had a lot of weird... Yeah, so it was clearly based on the Beta War Priest. And the Freelancer gave a really good archetype for the Beta War Priest that, unfortunately, due to, well, you know, the Advanced Class Guide, um, was never updated to the Final War Priest, even though the Final War Priest had a lot of changes and so since it was for the previous war priest which had which was roundly considered to be overpowered by the playtesters an unusual occurrence playtest classes 
usually won't be considered overpowered even if they are mostly because the people who are really excited and want to play the biggest baddest meanest version of that class are the ones who post in the threads about that class so the fact that the war priest was being considered to be overpowered was a was a big warning sign and hey i was just in the playtest at the time not at the company but jason uh, rightly so um uh, changed it away from having full base attack bonus but the sacred fist still did so that was um definitely a thing that got adjusted in the errata at the very least um so then the mesmerist and all the other classes got some nice archetypes that were from uh their person although once again since Jason is always too busy to um, really do everything. I did the occultist archetypes, and uh, I saved enough space in the occultist archetype that uh, that there was enough space for a new archetype. And certainly, uh, the Tome Eater and some of the other ones that were in there all along are just hilarious because you get to eat books, but. The new archetype that I added after talking around uh, the office and seeing what people liked was the Shair. And the Shair is real, really interesting, I think, just because your implements are these little elementals that are coming along with you. And it's just a very different flavor, but a very similar theme to the other archetypes. Um, let's see. So then we get to the other class archetypes. And... Some of these other class archetypes uh, are even to this day, this is a section of just miscellaneous archetypes that I really like. I think is a really strong miscellaneous archetype section. Just because they're really thematic, very few of them are brokenly overpowered. Um, some of them do some pretty big changes or adjustments. Like the Relic Hunter Inquisitor is an Inquisitor archetype that manages to give a huge amount of things from another class, but like we mentioned in the archetype uh, episode, it does it actually gives away enough from Inquisitor that it doesn't feel like it's overwhelming the, the, the chance to play an occultist. And then some of the other archetypes in here, like the Sensate and the Ghost Rider, are just a cool new idea that feel different than playing a normal fighter or cavalier. So this section was a whole lot of fun to work on. There were so many creative freelancers who wrote really cool archetypes in here and um basically pretty cool and i think people have liked that section as well and it's held up over the years pretty well that's an always another question about a book when it comes out because the reaction you see when a product first comes out is actually very different to the reaction you see later on and whether it holds up over the years um partially this is because of the fact that it's based on your gut reaction from reading it versus playing it and having it in your game, which is going to necessarily be different. Um, the second part of it is that early adopters sometimes have different opinions of, um, of a different product than other people do. Um, and Steve says it's also based on preconceptions about what you thought you were going to get. And that is, that is absolutely true. It is. It's just. It's also based on what demographic is the ones who get it, right? Like, um, for instance, there was a like the the weapon master handbook was very popular, but for the player companion, the armor master handbook got a lot of low reviews, and it got low reviews from people who said it was overpowered, and low reviews from people who said it was underpowered. And really, it's a pretty solid book. There are a few options in there that maybe like. They kind of make it superfluous to do a shield and weapon fighting style without using Armor Master because it can give you a two-handed weapon and a shield. Okay, sure. But mostly, it's just a solid book with cool and fun options. The problem is, a lot of the people who make first responses to any given player companion product are like the are cutting edge um, players who are looking for the most powerful new option for their character. Those are the ones who read it first. So... Armor, just as a as a defensive option, is not as sort of uh, attractive as an offensive option. So it was good. It was pretty much guaranteed to not be as attractive to people looking for those options. And so that's just that's just what happened. But I think down the line, a lot of people really liked Armor Master's Guide, and it doesn't have sort of the reputation it got from some of its early reviews. And you'll see similar things like that where Unchained Monk 
when it first came out, it was being compared literally only by people who were looking at their most optimized Sohei Zen Archer that they could build with the cha the regular monk, the chain monk, and they were saying like, oh no, Unchained Monk is, is not even stronger. It's it's stronger in some ways and has weaker will save. In other ways, it's about the same. This is not an upgrade to monk. This is supposed to be an upgrade to monk. This Unchained Monk has failed as a monk. But I think the consensus overwhelmingly has been that the Unchained Monk was a huge success down the line. And you'll tend to see things that shift a little bit um, as time goes by. Um, the... Steve says, Shifter suffered from expectations, albeit there were some issues, it wasn't as bad as people said, it wasn't what people expected. Honestly, I think you're right, Steve. Like, when the book was coming out, the question was, what would the new class be? And really, I was pushing, and, and Steven was very supportive of me, I wanted there to be a Marshall shapeshifter. My initial conception was just like, totally out there shapeshifter that like it turns its arm into a tentacle and it could turn its leg into a fin and just it shifts even different portions and was very complicated because some of my stuff is initially very complicated but i was pulled back onto starfinder during that time and honestly what i was thinking of maybe not wouldn't have fit with the wilderness theme as much as an animal um and i think that a lot of people thought it was going to be that weird shift everything that was what I thought of when I thought Marshall Shapeshifter, mostly because I'd read the threads, and that's why I suggested, hey, this is the thing everybody wants. And honestly, that's not what people were expecting, just like you said, and that's going to be part of it for sure. Um, King of Rock says he likes attaching grippers to spellcasters to provide continuous damage, then switch to Greatsword. That can always be fun. Switching around and not just hitting things over and over again, I find is more interesting. But usually it's not a better option in Pathfinder 1st Edition than just finding one thing that you're obscenely good at and repeating. I like that in Pathfinder 2nd Edition so far, there's been a little more variety. So, And I hope that that will continue. Um, Alright, so the feats section was, is always a section in, in a lot of books that is just like kind of a hodgepodge. And you don't always know what you're going to get. Sometimes it's a little bit, people are like, oh, these feats are all passable feats that I'm just going to skip. But I feel like Occult Adventures really did something good with these feats by making a lot of feats that were themed or linked um, potentially to some of the subsystems in the group. Obviously, all the extras of the things that usually get extras. But also for things like um, the psychic sensitivity feats, the stair feats, and some of the feats for the different classes. Um, Steve says, this is a definitely a selling point of Pathfinder 2nd Edition for me. In stories, it's relatively common to meet characters with a bunch of weapons. In 1st Edition, it's a waste of resources. Yes, yes, for sure. In 1st Edition, specializing super, super special in your one thing that always won, uh, except against like a scissors when you were a paper um, was kind of the strategy. And we're trying to move more towards characters who aren't penalized for deciding they want to branch out and get some cool stuff to help them in other situations or to do more narrative uh, things. And King of Rock says, Owen often says his damage focus war priest would overshadow other players. I saw that too, so I self-limited. I think that it's very easy to overshadow other players with almost any class in Pathfinder 1st Edition, just depending on where you're, or when you're overshadowing them. Like, some people who talk about caster martial disparities would claim, well, you know, a war priest or any kind of fighting person can't overshadow a 9-level spellcaster because they don't have the same narrative options. But the thing is, if the group considers narrative options to be a group decision and a group option then the spellcaster might feel overshadowed. A lot of groups do. Like, if they, if you need to get somewhere and you need to teleport there, and the group says, are we going to pay for a teleport? And the wizard's like, no, I have teleport. Then the group is grouply doing teleport. And they're like, cool, wizard, thanks for having teleport. But that fundamentally isn't quite the same thing as being the person in the group who just busts everything in an encounter. And I'm not saying spellcasters can't do that, but... Non-spellcasters absolutely can do that too. And in your in a particular group, a non-spellcaster or a lower spellcaster like a war priest 
might easily be the character that's doing that more. And that's something that people who only focused on narrative power really just, I think, were missing in group dynamics. And I've talked about this a little bit on one of the other streams about why the summoner was often criticized as um, being overpowered when maybe it's not more powerful than some of the other classes. And that's because it was both a source and a sink for buffs. So you don't see the wizard casting the buff on the fighter and being the one providing the utility spells. They're just doing it to their other character. Uh, Steve says there are admittedly some editing problems. It's no big deal to fill in the gaps. Ultimate Wilderness was a great book, in my opinion. Honestly, like I wish I would have had more time uh, to work on Ultimate Wilderness because it's a cool topic that I really like, but I was in Starfinder for most of its cycle and didn't get a chance to look at a lot of it, but I actually think that Ultimate Wilderness was a very solid book compared to the way that most people talk about it. I think it's mostly because everyone was focused on the shifter, which again defied their expectation. They probably thought it was more of a flexible shapeshifter than a sort of totemic shapeshifter. And then they kind of painted in that brush throughout all the rest of the book. And there are some real sleeper archetypes in that book in particular, because I did work on some of the archetypes. That's one of the things I had time for. There are some sleeper archetypes in that book that are super cool. And you don't see people talking about it that much. And Steve, honestly, this goes back to a point that we were talking about earlier in this very stream about the class is your identity. The class is you. If that doesn't satisfy you, it could turn a customer off from an entire book full of options where the rest of the book is 95% of the book and the class is only 5%, like the shifter. Um, all right. So King of Rock says we had a mutagen in the group as well. I wanted to differentiate his fighting style. I, I think that's about the War Priest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's important to always work together as a group, in my opinion, to figure out what you're going to do, GM and players. That's the best way to have fun with the game. If you can't get into agreement about that, especially in Pathfinder 1st Edition, where the difference between an optimized character and a less optimized character is more than the difference between a 10th level character and a 20th level character in some cases. If the 10th level character is really optimized and the 20th level character is really, really bad um, in that regard. Alright. So, um, th basically, yeah, in feats, um, there are a lot of fun ones. And I definitely like some of the art that's in there for the kineticist that I ordered. Like, Yoon being like, nope, to the White Dragon's breath weapon. And Yoon and the Undine do, um, creating boiled chul with a steam blast that they coordinatedly blast together. Because who doesn't like boiled lobster? I, I'm a vegetarian, so I don't eat that. But if I did, I would like that. Um, plus... There's also uh, Mavaro trying to talk to a bunch of Kami in the woods, which is just kind of hilarious and a good a good picture for that feat about uh, Xenoglossy, another one of those weird occult topics. I learned about a lot of occult topics. Like I didn't know about Xenoglossy. I had heard of, of, of Phrenology and some of the other ones that were in this book, but it's just great that they all came from like real-world crazy occult traditions. Um, speaking of which, so obviously there were a lot of spells that we had to work on during this book. Uh, coming up with cool new spells was something our freelancers did, and they gave us some really great spells. As usual, one of the things I did was take spells off of the wizard sorcerer wizard list that didn't really fit because freelancers almost always put every spell that they submit to you onto the wizard sorcerer list unless it is healing, and then they don't. Uh, so... I consider one of my biggest accomplishments in spell design passes in Pathfinder 1st Edition was the number of spells I removed from the Sorcerer Wizard list. Or in some cases, they, the Sorcerer Wizard gets late access, um, and the Psychic gets a little bit of earlier access uh, back in Pathfinder 1st Edition. This is also the very first book that has is in my series of, I think, three um, pictures where I tried to order a Mary fighting the Frost Giant who was she got her sword from and all uh three of them it failed but here is a near car you can see that she is fighting a frost giant with an axe uh no matter how many times you say 
it should have a big giant sword that's the one that she's holding because she gets it from him uh the thing is the best scary fresh giant had an axe so it pretty much is gonna have an axe king of rock says mavaro is one of my favorite iconics plus size brother like me i really like that mavaro gives a different body type than some of the other iconics a cult adventures was a chance to give some really different body types and some really different age types because occult stories often have those kind of situations and that's why you you, you know you have estra and you have yoon in occult adventures as well and movaro um and estra at one point there was an idea that like onair was pushing her in a wheelchair but there were there were a few things with that in particular about the art that was a non-starter because um the art team knew that that, that wasn't really going to work for the situation and the hidden twig mentions Yoon, the kid kineticist. Yep, Yoon is my favorite iconic because not only did I write her class, but I got to write her backstory as well. So, plus I have the Yoon um, avatar on Pyzo.com and I, I made a little Ask Yoon All Your Questions Here thread that was a lot of fun. I had to do research because I didn't know that much. People would ask about like food and I don't know that much about Korean food, so I looked stuff up online and said some random things. I was like, I don't know if this is really right or not. But then Tanya, um, who lived there for a while, was like, who's answering the responses for the Yoon Kineticist thread? These are really accurate. And so that made me feel really good uh, about my Yoon Kineticist uh, little thread. That only went for a little while. It was not as popular as the Ask Mauricio Silvari, all your questions here thread, because Mauricio, I think, is less of a niche iconic as well than, um, than Yoon is. So Psychic Magic, all of those new spells, pretty cool. But I think that really, it, it when people think of the cornerstones of the book, uh, what they usually think of is either the classes or the occult rules chapter. I'm going to tell you that we still haven't gotten to what I think is the hidden gem and cornerstone of the book. And the one page that I memorized and always turned to when I was selling people occult adventures books at Gen Con. That really gave an idea of what the heck this is and helped explain it's not science. I'll tell you when we get there. We're not there yet. We are in the occult rules. So occult rules was a really cool one. And uh, David Nielsen guesses Mindscapes. Nope. But I really like Mindscapes. Occult Rules was really cool, especially since these are some of the rules that really tied in um, to the occult traditions. And so, with the exception of Possession, which we sort of wrote in-house as a clarification section, and Occult Rituals, which I think mostly Steven rewrote the entire chapter, and then I did a pass on to help um, us come up with it. Um, all the rest of this chapter oh no there's also psychic duels i think steven wrote that in-house because he had done some some house duels but like chakras auras the occult unlocks eric uh and brandon wrote those brandon wrote the occult unlocks and eric wrote auras and chakras and it is usually pretty hard to find enough time in the year for our publisher to have enough time to write some sections but eric definitely um got really deep in and you can see it's like all the colors of the emotional spectrum from like the hokey what color is your mood stone thing that he 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 plumbed the depths of some of those really interesting pseudo scientific weirdly magical um occult things to get us colorful auras all the different kinds of auras people could read and and all the chakras in kundalini chakra theory and Brandon found all of these weird ways that you could use different skills in a bizarre... Uh, David says passion project for Eric for sure. Eric, Mona, and Brandon Hodge both love occult. And honestly, if you hadn't shown me Brandon and just showed me Eric, I would say I would have trouble thinking of someone who really, really loves this th that much more. But then I also met Brandon, so... He's got Eric Top there, just from his crazy big occult collection. Uh, but this was just a really fun section, and Occult Rituals was one of the parts of the book that was amazingly popular, even more than we expected. It was popular from fans. It was popular in-house from some of our developers who just said, where have these been all of our lives? These are so great for when we need 
a plot device of the villain doing some weird special ritual. And cult rituals became one of the subsystems in the book that was the most expanded in later products of any of these. Um, King of Frog says, I'm always looking into my adventures to find objects with psychic significance for the Mesmerist to text spell. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Also having object reading with either the skull unlock or the uh, occultist psychometry ability is just a lot of fun. You can get a lot of, you can get some weird situations going on with object reading. We definitely had some, I think we did uh, the horn adventure, the one where you're in Bravoy during the occult playtest and there was an occultist there and we object read some objects and found out a bunch of really weird things that we wound up using in the adventure. So it was, it's definitely a lot of fun and it's just a, a lot of these occult ideas may not be super powerful. They may not even be narratively enough to really rest the course of the entire narrative, but they're just a real great opportunity for role play and a great opportunity to inject backstory that you guys all know from the adventures that you read, where it's like, here's two pages of backstory that no one will ever know except you, probably, about all these situations. And those some of the cult spells are a great way to get the players and the PCs that information in a way that's cool and that makes sense, rather than be like, hey guys, just so you know, this thing, um, after, after the adventure is over. So, definitely... Um, Occult Adventures was kind of really great for that, in my opinion. And these subsystems were a lot of fun to work on. There, well, I got to work on each and every one of them at least once, either in a pass after Steven or just in, in my own separate pass. So now we're going to get to what I consider to be the real cornerstone, the hidden gem, and it's not super easy to find in the um, table of contents that it is a hidden gem or... Nowhere does it say turn here first, and it's randomly in chapter 6, which is close to the end, but not the end. But running an occult game. Running an occult game, the intro to the chapter, not not even just the other later stuff like occult locations, although that was cool too, but just the section about incorporating the occult into your game. What are What does it mean to have elements of the occult? What are some of the themes of the occult? And what are some possible occult adventures and campaigns? Those are, this is absolutely the heart of the book. If you only were to read one little snippet, or like, it, let's say you have one of those Google previews where um, you put up a part of the book to preview before someone buys, I would put up this part. Because even after people told me what a cult was, even if after we sort of had that dinner with Brandon, the fact that I, I think... I, I remember I was sick at the time or something and I took this home with me and I was developing, uh, doing a design pass on running an occult game, this section. And by doing my pass on this section, I learned so much more about occult and it just all clicked for me when I was done. And I think people really didn't pay attention to it at, that much because it didn't have rules for your character, didn't even have rules for your GM that were rules, but is a super um, super useful section and just to make sure it was really good um, in terms of getting the information out and being very teachable um, since this section it felt to me like such a cornerstone I actually passed it to Linda to do an unofficial second look at the organization and structure because she has a master's in teaching and is really good at getting information flow out so I think that it works really well and it became sort of the the example that um, horror and intrigue both had a section like this that followed in a similar theme that were very, very effective. Uh, at least if people read them. <laughs> and King of Rock mentions the Akashic stuff, Dream Realms, and Lang. Those are those are definitely great elements of, of, of Occult Adventures as well. Occult um, also has um, the Occult locations, which includes some of Brandon's additional haunt rules. Um, not j they weren't just in Carrying Crown. He also had some like chained haunts and a rapping spirit that's not doing like a song rap. It's like kind of seances, ley lines, which we we sort of were in the background of some Pathfinder stuff, but was never really defined. That was an interesting one because when Logan and I were working on 
uh, when Logan and I were working on the ley lines, uh, we had to talk to people like, where, how have ley lines been represented in the past? Uh, were they represented here? Um, and hold on one sec. Linda, that was not someone knocking on the door. I was rapping to be a rapping spirit. Oh, never mind. If you saw me looking to the side and mouthing, it was because Linda was doing something weird and I didn't understand it. And the answer was she thought someone was knocking on the door. So you can see a rapping spirit can really confuse people. Um, so we wanted to know how ley lines had actually been used in the past. And the answer was nobody really remembered. So um, we got to kind of define ley lines here as well as Mindscapes. Uh, Logan did a lot of work on the Mindscapes as well. And... Well, David, I would not say that to me that they're the heart of the book. They're still a really cool uh, option that we didn't have before. Then there's a section on esoteric planes. This is another section from Eric. It's a very, very interesting section because of the fact that it had such cool takes on the planes and it directly contradicted a lot of our previous stuff. So that's why we got to put in one of like my favorite pieces of art in terms of just the idea of it. It may not be like the one I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so gorgeous, it takes my breath away. I'm not saying it's a bad piece either, but the one on page 239 where Rivani and um, Enora, the psychic and the arcanist, have gotten into a nerd range argument over the planes. And they're just sort of diffidently standing, and Enora has stood on a chair so that she's not towered over quite so much by Rivani. And um, they're just, like, somewhat glaring at each other. And there's this big picture of the planes. And there are different diagrams of the planes up on, on the board. And they're just in this giant fight. Because as someone who came from academia to gaming, uh, if you think that um, gaming has some pretty vicious arguments, academia has the, the old un unknown quote of, no politics other than academic politics are as vicious because nowhere else are the stakes so low. And so here we have the nerd rage between the uh, the occult spellcaster and the arcane spellcaster about how the planes work. And it was a lot of fun to talk about how these occult takes on the planes were just, that's what the occult people thought. And they say, oh, ours is really true. And everyone, uh, 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 and you guys don't know, it's the inner truth. And the, everyone else says, no, that's not true. It fits completely in with the themes of a cult from the beginning of this chapter that I mentioned about peeling off layers of onions to get to the hidden truth and the question of whether or not um, what you really found is the final truth. It sort of leads to people asked me also when the book came out, if they didn't think it was psionics, they said, well, the occult, that's just what everything is about in Pathfinder. Why is occult different than arcane or divine? I always explained it as, like, arcane magic is something that's studied in schools. It's well documented and known how it work, that it works, and people agree and believe in it. Occult magic is more like that guy, the guy who goes out and the wizards are all like, what are you doing? And the occultist is collecting, like, 50 different weird folklore remedies and spells that... In, in, like, old husband's tales are being passed along through. And the wizard's like, this is all balderdash. Why are you even looking at this? And then the occultist said, oh, some of them might be true. And then the occultist studies, and 100, 200, and one of the 200 things was real. But it was a ritual that any even simple peasant or non-spellcaster could do to open up a pit to hell. And the occultist thinks, I shouldn't really spread this information. And the wizard comes back and says, well, occultist, did you find anything real out of your balderdash? The occultist looks to the wizard and is like, no, I guess I didn't. I guess you were right, wizard. And that's sort of the difference between um, the occult and just sort of the arcane and the magic. Because all magic is magic. And sometimes, especially when you see, um, like, reporting on, there was another murder in real life, and it was it had an occult connection. It just just means kind of magic or demons or things like that. And here, that's what the occult means. It's hidden from the word occult, which has the same root as occlusion. All right. So the very last chapter is the occult rewards, and that was one that it had some 
some weird um, occult adventuring gear at the beginning that um, I didn't really work on as much, but there's some really cool things in there. And then some magic items. Oh, it looks like Steve's cat says uh, semicolon LK uh, apostrophe quote, 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 quote. Uh, but uh, there were some cool items that we got to put in. And this was just really a place to put weird items and ones that people think would do things like a dream catcher or a lucky horseshoe or four leaf clover and shrunken heads, the haunted dolls, maniac hands, like all of those sort of among the monkey's paw, the portrait, uh, or sorry, the picture of Dorian Gray and my personal favorite, the Stanham Crown, a.k.a. the Tin Foil Hat. Although we also had a Tin Foil Cap that was the weaker version. But the Stanham Crown, it just sounds so marvelous. And it's really just the uh, really powerful Tin Foil Hat that, that people were wearing. So these, these had a lot of items that were based on sort of real world superstitions and occultism that got to become a real magic item. Uh, plus it had talismans, which were just sort of a cool idea of these one-off items that you could wear. Um, sometimes they upgrade to once per day that just did something cool and protected you. And that's one that I think we probably could have made more new talismans than we did. We did make more new talismans. There were some in horror and a few other places. But I feel like talismans were something that is a big enough and broad enough idea that they, they would have legs even in like in second edition as a category, at least in my personal opinion. Uh, plus we have the Elder Sign that can't be called the Elder Sign, so it's the primordial symbol uh, because the Elder Sign is the Elder Sign. So that is, uh, that is basically all the different chapters of Occult Adventures. As a whole, on the project, we did a lot of passing things around, as you can see from my saying, oh yeah, Steven looked at that, and then I looked at that next. Uh, we still hadn't quite moved into having two design passes as the standard at that point, so some of the sections didn't have two design passes, um, particularly some of the sections that I was looking at, but I was just very revved up and ready to go on some of these things in this book, and I was new, and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and so I wound up looking at as you saw from my talking through it really a lot of the different things in this book and I'm pretty proud of my work on Occult Adventures and of Logan Stephen Jason's work on Occult Adventures just and all the freelancers and the editors the art team and the artists who made the art everybody who went into Occult Adventures to make it the book that it was because uh I just think it's a really awesome book. It's one that um, some people um, some people list it as a high watermark. Um, a lot of people have different high watermarks. The Advanced Player's Guide is one that some people list as well as just being when Pathfinder really reached started to reach its own. But um, Occult Adventures definitely was one of the few books where really a lot of the people not on the design team but just that were attached to it like Brandon and Eric that really had this huge passion for it and to an extent some of the other books like in Ultimate Intrigue I have a big passion for intrigue plots but that didn't mean that like that many other people necessarily had as much of a passion as Brandon and Eric have for for the occult so um that's sort of my basic uh, stroll through down memory lane looking through the different chapters of occult adventures Do you guys have any questions for me about um what it was like to work on occult adventures the occult in general or any of those sort of themes that i can talk about here now if anybody does i'd be happy to take a question or two Also, let me check something for you guys. Thank you for cheering. I want to make, now that someone has actually cheered, I want to make sure that you guys got a giant XP reward as you were supposed to for cheering. Do, 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 manage users. Yes, you did. Steve has over a thousand XP now. He has more than I do. Um, so it worked exactly as planned. All right, great. All right, we do have a question. It is, how long is the whole process? 
from the outline to staff through to submitting it to the printer. Um, okay, Steve. So um, let me um, let's see if Linda can beat me to the punch on this. Is this up on Twitch still or is it on YouTube? Uh, but, uh, uh, no, it's here. It's on YouTube. Um, I'm going to link you to my YouTube video. So, Steve, this is um, a YouTube video called Behind the Scenes, Making an RPG Book. And it goes step by step through every step in the process from the fevered imaginings of Brandon Hodge and Eric in this case or whoever, wherever you start with the idea for the book all the way through to being uploaded on paizo.com. It doesn't always give exact, I, I probably should have and maybe didn't give the exact timing of all of those steps, but you might be able to get a sense of the time from that episode. Plus, um, as it says on the description, you get to see my poorly drawn diagram of the uh, Paizo cre creative team sort of minus Starfinder because it's about a Pathfinder book and I ran out of space uh, before I could put all of Starfinder in it. So Starfinder is just a, says Starfinder team and doesn't have everybody. But uh, it's a diagram I refer to throughout that episode because you'll see it changes hands, goes back and forth, lots of interaction at every step during the process. I mostly describe in that video how it works now that all the teams are working together. It's worth noting that at the time of Occult Adventures, everything was a little bit more of an enclave where... Um, sort of there was a little bit less back and forth working together you didn't have leads for every team that were in that book from the beginning sort of like i was for the design team on the world guide back then a campaign setting book would not have a designer attached and similarly we're going to have development leads for uh the rpg books but they wouldn't have a de called adventure did not have a developer attached um and so it talks about the process in that video, but also talks about some of the things that changed or some of the things um, that it used to be back in the past. All right. Well, uh, thanks for the question, guys. So first, I'm going to say goodbye to YouTube. So bye, YouTube. See you next time. It's going to be a while for you, too.